The Cult of Pears from Chapter 1, Garbage and the Goddess by Bubba Three John As might be inferred from reading Bubba's talk, two reactions surged simultaneously through those present, terror and ecstasy. Bubba had made it un unmistakably clear that the guilt and other feelings that seem to afflict people are really limitations they themselves arbitrarily enforce upon their enjoyment of life and each other. They are voluntary strategies enacted at every level of life in every moment to prevent mutual enjoyment of the divine in the forms of life. This speech was the culmination of many hints, reprimands and direct statements made earlier, but in this talk the apparently different themes of Bubba's recent communications became a single uncompromising statement. This talk brought many devotees to an acute awareness in which they saw, if only for a moment, just what they were doing in the strategies of their usual lives, individually and, and collectively. The clarity of this insight would rise and fall in the days and weeks to come, but on that night, as the Saturday night massacre, they could not help but allow Bubba's words to penetrate. They could see the concrete responsibility which lay before them to undermine the cult, and really to live freely, not merely to enjoy some inward spiritual looseness or detachment. This prospect profoundly threatened every individual because, as Bubba said, the usual social life is only an extension and elaboration of the activity by which people create their very sense of separate or egoic existence. Those present also feared what Bubba himself would do next. They knew he was going to do more than just talk. All these specific fears only expressed an underlying dread of death. Bubba had insisted from the beginning of his work with devotees that the, that the divine must not merely be realised inwardly, but must be lived. By revealing how all usual social interactions ritually preserve a sense of separate existence and by demanding that devotees responsi responsibly cease to indulge that activity. Bubba was making it less possible for them to ignore the divine in daily life. It was threatening them with their deaths as separated and separative individuals but in the condition of life itself not merely in subtle realms of consciousness. Jerry Scheinfeld, one of Bubba's long-time long devotees, gave us an account of his responses at that time. He illustrates the inadequacy of merely intellectual understanding and the necessity for the absolute death of a separate one. When he spoke of our cults and contracts and how they are insecure strategies for survival, I felt the inevitable end of my present relationship with my wife, Ellie. Enormous anxiety gripped my body. I rushed into uncontrollable fear. From my toes to my head, this body was charged with adrenaline. I told Baba I was petrified at the thought but that I love him more than I love me, and I was willing to go through the transformation. I began to intellectualise the validity of his words, and saw how my contracts in life are binding and arise from a prior separate condition, how the cult of marriage has intermingled emotions of possession, guilt, fear and the like. At the level of, of intellect, I was willing to let our cult dissolve, but as Ellie and I began living this freedom, narcissists would constantly arise in the forms of jealousy, concern, and all the rest of those well-known acts of suffering. 
After Bubba had finished speaking, the community watched the evening movie and then continued, at least outwardly, to party in the lounge and the baths. After hearing Bubba's words, devotees could hardly look at each other at times, but neither could they continue subtly to avoid each other in the usual comfortable and mediocre ways. Attention began to intensify. The next day, there was a wedding. Bubba talked informally during the feast and celebration that followed, and everyone spent the afternoon and early evening together in the baths. Bubba was somewhat quiet while at the baths, and many devotees said they felt the intensity of his presence to be particularly strong, but there was nothing silent or yogic about the party there. Most people were trying to be open, free and loving, as Bubba had demanded they be. Bubba drank and smoked and moved around the pool, laughing and showing particular affection to a few new, seemingly uncertain, devotees. My devotees felt threatened in the midst of their new attempts to break down their cultic associations and to begin to live freely together. One couple that made such an attempt was Sal and Louise Lucania. Sal and, Sal and Louise had been with Bubba for almost six years, having become acquainted with him before the specific function of Guru came alive in him in 1970. Although only in their early thirties, they had married while still in their teens and had three sons, one of them a teenager. Sal had been an aggressive, dynamic, tough character who had made his way the hard way off the streets of New York. He had been the administrator of a large and successful drug prevention program there before he came out to Los Angeles to help Baba start the ashram in 1972. And now he was something of a right-hand man to Baba in the administration of the ashram. In the early days, before Public Ashram Centre had been created, Louise had often fed everyone who came to the ashram study groups at her and Sal's house, and even now people kidded kidded her for the motherly role she tended to take in the community. But she and Sal were no less vulnerable to Bubba's demands than anyone else, and in many ways they were made more vulnerable by the breaking of their marriage contract than others were, simply because of the many years they had been together. Out of the contract with one another, and as Louis Slater said in the interview, no, sorry, after the talk Saturday night, they had acknowledged to one another that they did not, that they did have an ongoing contract with one another. And as Louise later said in an interview, they set out to break it or violate it intentionally. So that Sunday they avoided one another and stayed with other people. Louise felt absolute terror and fear. The crisis came to her head when she saw Sal sitting with another woman in the baths. At first she ran away, but knowing that this incident was likely to be the first of many, she returned to simply watch them together and deal with her reactions. I said to Bubba, well, there is that crunch again, and I went into meditation and relaxed everything. I didn't mentally say that I was going to relax. Everything just did relax. I felt that I had dealt with the fear of Sal's making love to another, and it didn't arise in me any more, at least not for the time being. When Louise and all the other members of the community were to discover what were to discover was that this crunch doesn't vanish forever after having once dissolved in one's turning to the guru with understanding. They would find that the contracts of all conventional social arrangements, such as marriages, friendships and the like, operate on far subtler levels than the merely physical, and that one cannot truly dissolve any contract by simply throwing one's partner away. 
but Louise did learn a valuable lesson by facing her fear in that instant, living through it while turning to the guru and seeing it dissolve in understanding, which is awareness prior to the activity of suffering. Others experience no such relaxation of their fears in that afternoon, and the drama only heightened later that night. Everyone came. Everyone came to the lounge for a movie at nine o'clock, but before it could begin, people found various musical instruments and others and began spontaneously to sing, and to make a primitive, non-melodic, drum-dominated music. Others danced to it, some partially naked, and one or two on tabletops. People were evidently enjoying themselves, but there was also a frenzy to this song, as if the wildness were an attempt to find relief from the pressure that had been building up all weekend. Then Bubba showed up, wearing a bright blue-striped yellow kaftan. His hair was still wet from a shower and his eyes were sparkling he laughed at the wild goings on and watched them for almost an hour Sal Lu Lu Lucania and Neil Panico stood near him along with a number of others mostly women abruptly Bubba left for his house again with Neil and Sal and conspicuously several women some of whom were married but none of their husbands, and none of the four women who ordinarily lived and served at Bubba's house. By this time it was obvious to everyone that Bubba wasn't just criticising the forms of our social lives, but also destroying them. Helly Scheinfeld, whose husband was quoted earlier, describes the reactions she experienced that evening. When we were dancing Sunday night, the whole feeling took on a heavy quality for me because I was attached to many things, to my husband, to earthly things, and I went through a heavy crisis at that point. I went into the satsang hall and literally surrendered everything, absolutely surrendered it. I went through spontaneous violent kriyas and other shakti manifestations. I was howling and screaming and wailing. It was just incredible. I couldn't believe it was me. The pain of it was ecstasy. It is hard to explain that. You are in pain and you are dying, and in that suffering there was great ecstasy. It lasted about half an hour, and then I was fine, and I left the Saxang Hall. I wanted to be near Bubba. He was my string, my connection, my life. I didn't want to be away from him. I was in agony because I had been away, I had to be away from him, and that was hurting me more than all the experiences I was going through. When Helly let go of her vital attachment to her husband and her various other life contracts, the release of the energy that had been bound up in that in them stimulated queers or spontaneous jerky movements of the spine and neck, as well as screaming and wailing. All these are signs of the purifying movement of the life force through the psychophysical system. They are signs of the resistance that obstructs the free and natural flow of that force, whose movement is regenerated as the circle of conductivity by the miraculous activities of the Guru. Heli felt that purifying, freer flow as a blissful sensation, a sense of release, but its pressure against the remaining obstructions was also extremely painful. Thus, her ecstatic agony. Helly said she had surrendered absolutely, but she, like Louise, had more sadhana in store. Even so, for now she had realised her connection to the Guru much more strongly and felt an intense need to be near him physically. Jane Panico whose husband Neil had gone to Bubba's house that evening, experienced no such resolution of, of her crisis. But she came to see the crisis itself with clarity. 
This was not the first time Bubba had worked on the martial and sexual attachment of his devotees. She said in an interview a week later that she had known for months that her attachment to Neil was going to be ripped off. She says, I knew it was going to be very painful and a death experience. Now it was happening. Neil was drinking at the party in the afternoon and that evening he, he went down to the lounge. He was kissing all these women and it really upset me. I didn't just, it didn't just upset me. I was absolutely freaked out, so freaked out that I considered leaving the ashram because I saw no way that I could ever resolve that feeling inside myself. It was so intense, so awful and so painful that I just knew I could never resolve it, that it would never go away. I felt absolutely possessed. I was possessed by myself. My psyche was suffering. I spent a long time with Kathy Bray and she talked to me talk to me and I told her that I wanted to leave. I felt like I had no capacity at all for spiritual life, that I couldn't handle it. I couldn't even handle the fact that I would actually consider leaving. She told me that I must, must turn to Bubba and surrender it and I said, I don't know how. I really don't know. Your words just seemed like rhetoric to me, just words. I knew then that what had to occur was a fundamental understanding that had nothing to do with the words at all or experiences. The actions of Bubba and Neil had triggered an overwhelming crisis in J Jane, one from which she could not distract herself. In the thick of it, she realised that she truly needed to understand that nothing else would avail her, and she knew that the intelligence of that understanding must be an entirely different nature than either abstract contract, concepts or felt experiences. Later that night, the movie was finally shown in the lounge. Over at Bubba's house, an apparently uproarious party was going on. While he was partying with Bubba and the others, Sal Lucania, was also undergoing a crisis. After the wedding earlier that day, Bubba had spoken about early Christian times and had said that many of us had been alive then and had participated in that religious movement. A humorous and paradoxical thing for him to do, since just the evening before he had ridiculed any interest in reincarnation. Every time Bubba had mentioned these those Christian days, Sal had felt rushes of energy shooting right out of the top of the head. Referring to those discussions, Sal said in an interview with the editors some two weeks later. So that's uh, Samuel and uh, Terry. So that Sunday night, after hours and hours of this kind of conversation, I was realising what was important about all of that, how insignificant and mediocre my attachments were. Time after time, when the re-establishment of the Dharma of Truth is taking place, I am afraid to give up a candy bar. This talk about contracts stirred up a crisis that had been going on for months. I began as a condition of spiritual life, to consider the breaking of the attachment to my marriage. I knew that to love God, to be a devotee, you have to be absolutely devoted. Bubba continued to lay on all that stuff about past lives very heavily when, he were, when we were over at his house Sunday night. Then he suddenly turned to me and said, Are you ready to give up your marriage? Then he asked, Then he suddenly turned to me and said, Are you ready to give up your marriage? Then he asked me if I was ready to die. He said, I mean it. When he said all this, he was sitting on a couch, 
and I was on the floor, and he was looking at me directly. That look penetrated the very core of my existence. I saw in that moment how that contract of my marriage to Louise was very strong, and everything was in it, mummy, daddy, everything. So it was a direct hit. That was the crisis. I had to make a choice between Bubba and karmic life, and I did. I decided I loved him more than anything in the world. He had always demonstrated such perfect flawlessness of love in relationship to me. So I told him I was ready, that I was willing to go anywhere with him. In his account, Sal indicates clearly how everything Bubba does, even an apparently random discussion of something as irrelevant as past lives, functions only to serve the spiritual process in his devotees, specifically to bring about the present crisis of their understanding. At this particular time, Bubba was striking directly at the social contracts of his devotees. His disruptions of these cults in each case did not merely leave each person sad or hurt. As Sal said for himself, the threat of the breaking of the marriage contract was a direct hit. He had invested so much of himself in his identification with it that all his primary relationships were epitomised in that single association. His whole identity as a separate individual was bound up in that association with Louise, and when it was threatened with death, he felt threatened with death. Louise had felt the same threat earlier in the day, and it provoked terror in her. Others may not have experienced that threat quite so directly and fully, if they were not so identified with one particular attachment. But throughout this narrative, Sal, Neil and several others will serve as illustration of the general experience of the entire community. They weren't special, but their experiences were particularly dramatic. Practically everyone in the ashram was going through similar crises in that point. Through violations of the normally assumed social contracts in the ashram, violations initiated by themselves or by Baba, everyone felt this, his identity somehow at stake. This is precisely what Baba intended, not marriages themselves, but the priestly form of narcissists. The ego standing in the Guru's presence was the intended victim of the Saturday night massacre. So that ends the Cult of Pairs in Chapter 1 of Garbage and the Goddess. So what exactly does Adidas want of us? He wants us to be given up in that contemplation of his bodily human form, in that turning. Turn away from yourself, he keeps telling me. Turn away to me. Keep turning to me and you'll find you are already happy and you're on your own. It's quite scary to be on your own. No contracts. No attachments. No patternings. No more karma. No tendencies. No you, no me. All dissolved all dissipated, all surrendered in that heart communion, that love communion that dissolves all separation, all the nonsense of division and barriers. It's, it's gracefully happens. You can't do it on your own. I can't do it on my own. It's just a miracle that this life force is swimming through me right now. This absolute love, bliss, joy, delight. No separation. No separation from anything. Everything, even this rubber band. 
There's no separation. No separation. <laughs> it's just no separation. What I mean it's what is ord ordinary, natural, inherently natural, inherently already the case. Nothing nothing interrupting it, nothing destroying it anymore. It's just there. It's been revealed to me time and time and time again simply because is it because I am willing to grant him my attention? It's even that's even gracefully happens. It, the granting of him one's attention gracefully happens. And then all this nonsense that you keep creating between me and you, or you and me. Do you love me? Whoever you are? Are you in love right now with everything that's arising? Everything that's arising, no matter what there is. Are you in love? Is there any separation? between you and this watch? Is there any separation between whatever, this, these actions, these, the action of putting on the watch? Is there a separate, separative, is it a separative act? Is there any separation, any division? Can you lick everything? Can you kiss everything? Can you, is everything Is everything together, there's no separation, indivisible, dark, dark.